the younger son and what the Bible can teach us about him. And then this morning we're going to be looking at the older brother. The older brother. Here in Luke chapter 15, we'll begin in verse 20. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. He said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as, son hath, but as, soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Will, open us up in a word of prayer this morning, please. Right. Lord, the church, Lord. Lord, to revive us, Lord. Uh, speak to us, Lord. Speak to our hearts. Help us to get the sin out of our lives, Lord. And open up our hearts and lives to you and put you first. Truly lift you up on that pedestal and put us down, Lord. Lord, be with us today and be with the pre- preaching, Lord. Uh, use, use the pastor, Lord, to uh, lead, guide, and direct his people, Lord. Uh, strengthen us to receive it, Lord, and, and convict us, Lord, and help us to do something with it. And not just take it as some some uh, message that we like and we talk about later. Lord, help us to actually apply it to our daily lives. Lord, keep us safe throughout the day and bring us back at the next point of time. Lord, in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Notice here, first of all, concerning this elder son in verse 25. Now his elder son. Here he is. He's older. He's more mature. He's been in the father's house all this time. His elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. What's he doing in the field? He's working. Sure, he's he's serving. He's working for his father. Amen? And, uh, and, And unfortunately for many of God's people, the thing that keeps them from a true relationship with the father is their is their labor for the father let, let, let me re- repeat that again in, in case you, you you might have missed it you say i'm serving the lord okay all right good is there anything wrong with serving the lord you know what a lot do i'm serving the lord therefore i don't have to deal with god or have an actual walk with Him, because I can use my service, my ministry, my church, my whatever. Huh? Right? See? And uh, here's this older son. He's working for the Father. Everything must be right. Right? You know what his problem is? His heart isn't right with God. This whole situation that's occurred here with the younger brother is going to reveal the heart of this older brother. And unfortunately, it took all of this 
for that older brother to have his heart revealed. Because with everybody looking on the outside, it looked like the older brother was fine. It looked like everything was good. And here he is, he's serving the father. And yet, as we see through this story, there's a, there's a serious problem. There's a serious problem. And this problem has to do, really, if you look there, verse 26. He called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother has come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. He's angry. What's he angry about? Amen. Okay. So what is that? What do you call that? Envy. Envy. And what you're dealing with here is this older brother had the sin of envy. And do you realize that that is, if you were going to categorize or classify sin, that that would probably be one of the most, the worst sins because of the effect that it has on others, the effect it can have in a church. The effect it can have in someone's walk with God. And this older brother had a great sin. A sin greater, listen, than his younger brother ever had. And it was the sin of envy. Do you know why Cain killed his younger brother? Envy. Do you know why Absalom did what he did and turned against his own father that loved him so much? Envy. Do you know why Joab did some of the things he did and hurt the house of David the way he did? Envy. You'll see that all the way through the Scriptures is this sin of envy and the terrible effects that it has in people's lives. Look with me in Genesis 37. Genesis chapter 37. In Genesis chapter 37, we see this sin of envy. Verse 9 of Genesis 37, And he dreamed yet another dream. And told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him, and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? Talking about Joseph and the dream he had. Now look at this, verse 11. And his brother, his brethren, what? Envied him. But his father observed the saying. So what's the next thing that's going to happen? Verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Well, we've got to get rid of him. And the whole rest of this thing that's going to happen with Joseph... And the way his, his older brothers treat him is all because of the sin of envy. And you know what that thing is? Listen, that's the picture of Jesus Christ. Joseph is that picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is giving this parable. He's giving this parable to those Pharisees. You know what those Pharisees are getting ready to do in the very near future? Deliver Jesus Christ over to the authorities to be crucified. And you know why the Bible says they did it? For envy. For envy. Pilate knew that that's why they had delivered him. Was for envy. The great sin of envy. Look in Psalm 106. Psalm 106. Who are you envious of today? Anyone? Anyone? Is there anyone you're envious of today? Now, we get those words envy and jealousy confused. They're not the same. Okay. Jealousy is good. It can be. Now, it can be dangerous, but it's good. God is jealous. Amen? God's not envious. 
But God is jealous because jealousy is a result of love. And if you, if, if you truly love someone, uh, you'll be jealous for them. If you love someone, you want that same love. See? And uh, God is a jealous God, the Bible says. And uh, God wants our love towards Him first, above everything else. And what always happens in our lives with the Lord is whenever there's anything between us and God that we're loving more than Him... He's going to have to deal with it because he's a jealous God. He wants to be first because he's a jealous God. Is he first in your life? He's a jealous God. He demands to be first in everything. Amen. He has to come first. Now, that's not wrong. That's good. Now, envy. Envy is not good. Look there in Psalm 106. In Psalm 106 and verse 16. Look at this. They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. Now, that, that's in reference back there in Numbers, uh, chapter uh, 15, 16, if you remember the story of Korah and Dathan and Abiram. And uh, they came with a, a whole bunch of the elders of the people and told Moses and Aaron that, hey, we don't have to do it your way. We're just as good as you are. We're just as much God's people as you are. And uh, therefore, uh, Moses, you need to let us run the show in this church. Amen. Now, that's what the Bible calls it. It's a church in the wilderness. And God had Moses and Aaron established as his leaders in that church. And you know what some of the other men in that church did? They tried to get the church to follow them instead of following Moses and Aaron. Now, I know that would never happen today. We would never run into a situation like that the day and age that we're living in. But it happened back then. We're just supposing, you know. Back then, that's what happened in this God's church. In the wilderness, that's what happened. Why? Envy. And that's what it said. That was the root cause behind all. Oh, how come Moses and how come Aaron and why do they get it and not us? And that's where that whole thing started. And you had a little power play. You had a little push going on there. Let me ask you something. <clears throat> Who was it that God had put in place as the overseers of that church in the wilderness. You know where Paul talks about, we'll probably look at that in the message this morning, where Paul talks about that with the Holy Ghost, over there in Acts chapter 20, hath made you overseers, talking to the elders of the church. Now what happens when you get others that aren't that elder? The Bible says that other men shall arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. What's the root cause of that? It's envy. The Bible's showing you that right there. That's the sin. That's the sin that destroys churches. More church splits have been a result of envy over anything else. Because envy is the desire for that power, for that recognition, for that money, whatever the case, you see. The sin behind it all is the sin of envy. Look with me in Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs 14. And this older brother had a problem. He had a big sin problem. But his problem wasn't running down to the far country and drinking and, you know. He wasn't one of those kind of sinners. Amen. He was an acceptable sinner. Yeah, amen. Amen. He wasn't one of those, you know, down there in the hog wall sinners like the younger brother. He was a bad one. He, not him, though. He was, he was just an envious sinner. That's not really a bad sinner. He was probably, you know, banker and lawyer or something. You know, he was respected in the community. And uh, he wasn't one of those bad kind of sinners. Uh, over here in Proverbs chapter 14, look at verse 30. Verse 30. A sound heart is the life of the flesh. Now, anybody here in good shape? Hmm? You're good, your flesh, your body is in good shape. Are you keeping yourself physically fit? You know where that all starts? With a good cardio workout. Amen. It starts with a sound heart. 
He's not talking spiritually there. He's talking physically. Your flesh, the health of your flesh, depends on the health of your heart. You're not going to be healthy unless you have a healthy heart. Amen. And uh, the same thing goes for your bones. Now, if we don't have time to do a study on it, but if sometime, if, if the Lord ever leads you to, study bones in the Bible and what it has to do with your health and how long you live and everything else. Everything in your body starts with the health of your bones. Your blood is produced by your bones. And every, the life of the flesh is where? It's in the blood. And where's your blood produced? See? If you don't have healthy bones, guess what? You're not going to have a healthy body. Now, looking all that physically, compare it spiritually, and notice what he says here in verse 30, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. What will rotten bones do to the health of that body? My, my, my. It'll destroy it. It'll destroy it. The sin of envy. Look again in Proverbs chapter 27. Chapter 27. Verse 4. Wrath is cruel. Boy, you ever see someone just get real cruel? Wrath. I mean, just take it out. Wrath is cruel. I, I mean, you hear about some... Men that will beat their wives or beat their kids. and uh, It's cruel. Wrath is cruel. And anger is outrageous. But compared to envy? <laughs> Look at that. But who is able to stand before envy? Mm, mm, mm. See, so what's that saying? What's a worse sin than wrath? What's a worse sin than anger. See, on God's scale, would you agree what we're reading so far that envy is pretty high up there? If that was the root sin for our Savior being turned over to be crucified, if that was the cause for the church in the wilderness rebelling against God's established authority over them, if that was the root cause of the brothers of Joseph turning against him. What a sin. What a sin. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Look in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 and verse 10, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. In that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Have you done that, Christian? Have you cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light? That's, that's, man, I've got to get rid of all this. This ain't right. This isn't any good. This is darkness. I need to get rid of all this darkness. I need to be clothed with the armor of light. Verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife, and envying. Can you be walking in those things and be walking in the Spirit? Can you be walking in those things and, and have any effect against the works of darkness of this world? No. He says you put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. So what is one of the lusts of the flesh? It's envy. Look over in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, 
provoking one another, envying one another. Amen. And uh, a lot of that has gone on in this church in the last year and a half. A lot of that. And uh, the, the, what it produced wasn't good. And the flesh never produces anything good, so that shouldn't be a surprise. Look back there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three and verse three for a year yet carnal carnal church. You know why? Remember that fornicating that they were letting go on and well that ain't what he's talking about here. There was something worse than that. That isn't what made him carnal. The Corinthian church had a problem. What was it? Verse three. For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you number one problem was what? Envying, envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? See? Uh, I mean, the thing is so clear to me now. If it isn't clear to everybody else. If it isn't clear to you yet, that means you still haven't gotten right with God. But this whole thing, when this whole RU thing started in this church, and the reason that people had a problem with that, you know why they did? Because they had that spirit of that older brother. That's why. Period. They had that same spirit that that fellow has there. What does that produce? Envying and strife. That's what it produced. Where did that lead to? Amen. 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 And being the pastor, and being the youth pastor, amen. Strife was the result of it. You say, um, how did that happen? What was going on? Well, it's, it's always that idea that the other guy's sin is worse than mine. That's where it starts. You know, not those people. <laughs> now listen, if someone has got a disease, right... We don't want them in among us. We don't want somebody to catch something they have. See? Um, and so, that's an obvious thing. But when you're talking about people that are trying to get in and get help with sin, people that need to get saved, and you don't want to help them, you know what the problem is? You're filled with the devil. That's what your problem is. Flesh. It isn't the Spirit of God. It is not the Spirit of God. And the fact that you still haven't repented of that, you ought to be on your face crying out to God to have mercy on you. Amen. And the fact that you haven't yet shows you've got more deep-rooted problems than even you've realized. Amen. Amen. I love you. Now listen, I'm just giving you Bible. Look in James chapter 3. James chapter 3. I mean, right then when that Younger son came home. What if that elder brother had run into the house and grabbed his brother and lifted him up in the air and shouted and praised God? What unity there would have been in the father's house. What the father could have done. Oh, expect us to get the fatted calf to him. What's he been doing? That's that spirit. See? Look in James chapter 3. James chapter 3. And uh, verse 14. Verse 14. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts... Oh, no, I don't. No, not me. Oh, that's, that's somebody else. That's, that wasn't me. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. You know what you have to do? You have to admit it. If you're going to get anywhere, you have to admit it. And if you don't admit it, you're lying against the truth. You're lying against the Spirit of God. This wisdom descendeth not from above. Huh? But is what? Earthly, sensual, devilish. So when I said you're filled with the devil, I'm being scriptural. 
For where envying and strife is, what's the result of that? There is confusion in every evil work. Sound familiar? All a result of envy. That is the sin. That's the sin of the older brother. And that was the sin that wreaked havoc in this church, Lord knows. And I sure hope it's repented of and gotten out. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Wherefore, now look at this. You know what amazes me, brethren? Now listen. There was people that were in this church, some of them for not a very long time, but others for years, under my teaching and preaching, which isn't the best in the world. We all know that. But you're going to get some Bible, right? It should help you a little bit. It should help you to grow a little bit in your Christian life. Amen? Getting a little Bible in you sure shouldn't hurt you if your heart's right. Amen? But... Brothers, I don't mean to be mean, but we had people that have been in this church under my preaching for six to eight years. And then couldn't figure out why the pastor would have a problem with a group of these people wanting to have a fellow teach Sunday school that hadn't been in half of the church services over the last two years. And couldn't figure out what, what was the big deal about me not wanting him to teach Sunday school. Now, when you're dealing with people like that, it's not a problem of this. Because nobody's born that dumb. Right? It's a spiritual problem. Now, those same people, on a continual basis, were knocking on my door and had no problem, week after week after week, Letting Brother Ray know all the things he was doing wrong and all the problems he had, which, amen, plenty of them. But they never were able to grasp the fact that God sent me here to show them their problems. It wasn't their job to show me mine. But they could never get that. And so they could never see that Maybe he preached that message for me. <laughs> it never even would, would hit him. You know, and then they, that's the same crowd. When this RU thing came up, buddy, they had such a problem with it. So what is that? That's that spirit of that older brother. Amen. And then get a fellow come up and preach a message in the church. Could you give me a little liberty this morning? Just. Amen. Get it off my chest, right? Who is a member of our church. And have him preach a message. And he preaches a message on um, uh, the... Uh, ah, my Lord Jesus, help me. Uh, the, uh, the, not the prodigal son. The uh, Yeah, the Good Samaritan. Thank you. The Good Samaritan. Preaches that message with a heart against our you. And I got up there and said, well, thank you for preaching that message. He didn't even realize what he had done. Because of his envy, his envy had blinded him. Because if you truly were interested in the Samaritan, you would go out of your way across the street to help that one that nobody else wanted to have anything to do with. That's right. That's right. Yeah. See? And, and he's preaching that thing with a heart against our you. Well, he's preaching. He doesn't even realize that God had him do that to condemn himself. So what is that? That's, that's what envy does. It blinds you. Now, you know I'm telling you the truth. Don't get on a high horse. Don't get proud. I told you the truth right there. You ought to thank God for it. Amen. Now, look, and this is the reason why I'm saying that. You can, I can teach you all the Bible in the world. And you'll never grow. Maybe some of you haven't. 
You know why? Because it takes more than eating off of the Word of God for you to grow. There's something you have to do first. Look there in verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Amen. How are you going to grow? You need the Bible. You got to get, but guess what? That's the second part. You missed the first part. That's not the sentence. That's the second part of that sentence. Look in verse 1. Notice what ends the end of verse 1. Somebody tell me. Is it a period? It's a comma. You see? So you have to read verse 1 and 2 together. Look at verse 1. Verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire it. Look at that. You can't grow, no matter how much Bible you're feeding yourself on, until you're first willing to lay those things aside in your life. Amen. Or you could be coming to this church for eight years and not see a problem with us, you know, giving our van to a holiness church. There's all kinds of things you could think were okay because you're not spiritual, because you've never been able to grow spiritually, because you've never been willing to do what verse 1 said to do, and preacher's feeding you the Word of God, he's feeding you, the, and you're not growing. It must be the preacher. What's the preacher doing wrong? It ain't what the preacher's doing wrong. It's what the hearer hasn't done that the Bible said you're supposed to do. I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm telling you the truth. The Bible says we have to lay those things aside first. Then, see, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that we may grow thereby. But that growth will not occur until those things in verse 1 are taken care of. They have to be laid aside. All malice, all guile, all hypocrisies, all envies, and all evil speakings has to be put away from each of us. Now, look back there in, in uh, Luke. Oh, we've got to hurry up here. Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> I, I thought I was going to end early, but <laughs> now I've got to hurry. All right, Luke chapter 15. And verse 29. Luke 15 and verse 29. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. Now, you see anything funny about that? Huh? Well, okay, yeah. But what did he not transgress? His father's what? Commandment. Isn't that weird? His father only had one commandment? Isn't that weird? I've never transgressed your commandment. You, mean, you know what he's saying? I didn't do the one thing that my younger brother did. I never went to the far country and he did. Right? I didn't do that. He did. And so he's able to justify himself because he's looking at his younger brother, which he should be better than anyways, because it's his younger brother. And he should be the example for anyways, because he is his younger brother. But instead of saying, thy commandments, it's thy commandment. Well, here's one. Look, look back in uh, Proverbs 18. I just thought this was an interesting verse. Now, his brother was a great waster, amen? A prodigal. And he had disobeyed the father's commandment. There's no doubt about that. And we do not excuse that. But we praise God he got right. But here in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 19, uh, Proverbs, I'm sorry, 18 verse 9, He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. Isn't that weird? So who was that prodigal son's older brother? He just told you. In other words, he had his sins too. Like envy. Amen. But he couldn't see his. All he could see was the other guys. See? And that's the problem with, with that older brother. See? 
And uh, it's always the other guy and all the terrible things that he's doing. And he had another problem too. Look there in verse 30. We'll skip down real quick. Verse 30. Verse 30. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be... We, 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 son, we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. How could you not rejoice at that? See? How could you not be excited? And we had, what, um, 15 new registrations for RU last night. Amen. And four get saved. Amen. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. Isn't that a blessing? Now, let's face it, brethren. If I had said that a year ago with some of the crowd around here, that would have drove them crazy. That oh, no. So what is that? That's the spirit. That's that spirit of that older brother. See? Oh, why? Before we could say, well, that probably won't last anyway. I mean, all that is is a, a, a church in a church. Anyway. Well, what ministry isn't? That's a stupid thing to say. That's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Are you just a church in a church? What ministry isn't a church in a church? What's a church? Amen. What are you doing when you go to the detention center? Are you bringing them to church? I hope you are. Amen. When you go to the jail, are you going to bring them to church? I hope you are. Amen. When we go down in that street corner, where are we trying to bring them? Amen. That's how you get them in. They get in the church. Amen. Um, that's what we've got to have. So what was the problem? It was a love problem. Really. It was a love problem. That's what it was. Uh, look over there in 1 John. First John chapter 3. If he had really loved his younger brother, don't you think he would have been rejoicing? You know what he did? He talked about love. He always said how the preacher didn't have enough love. But when it came to him demonstrating love, he couldn't do it. Look there in verse 11. 1 John 3, 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And what was the root cause of that, you suppose, brother? Envy. Envy. Who can stand before envy? Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Well, that ought to be normal. We ought to... Isn't that something? When we can get along sometimes, the world doesn't give us as much trouble as some of God's people do. Isn't that weird? <laughs> That's something. That amazes me. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother... Is not right with God. <laughs> Amen. You don't you have no fellowship with God at all. That's what it just said. Abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. He's a faker. The faker. That's this older brother. But it, none of it is known. He is able to just kind of go through the motions and he's out in the field and he's there in the Father's house and everything looked fine. But buddy, when something like that happened, that younger brother gets right with God and gets in, then you see the true heart of that older brother. He was, he was angry that his brother returned. He was angry that his brother got right. What would cause... A Christian to respond that way. Something way off. Something way wrong. Now look, notice the whole, the reason the Lord's giving this parable, remember, is because of what was said in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Let's look back there uh, quickly. Luke chapter 15 and verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. 
And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. <laughs> yeah, that's what he was doing. That's what he was doing. That's what his ministry was about. It wasn't about reaching the Pharisees with all their highfalutin and their education and their money and their sophistication. And it wasn't about them. It was about reaching those sinners. And that's what he's telling them in this story. And he's letting them know when, when these sinners are coming to me, that's when your envy is made known. That's when it's all revealed. Them coming and this happening is revealing your own heart of your true condition and the problem of love that you have. And really, when you boil right down because of this thing with the Pharisees, really what this parable is, is it's a parable against the nation of Israel. And guess who the younger brother is? It's us. It's the Gentiles. It's just a bunch of heathen. It's, it's, a, it's a bunch of dogs that get to come in and get some crumbs from the master's table. Why? Because Israel, through envy, had a heart problem. And because of that, they weren't interested in the sun. <laughs> uh, look there in Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. You know why the Bible says over there in the book of Romans, why did God go to the Gentiles? Was it not to provoke Israel to jealousy? Wasn't that his intention all along? Look there in Isaiah 65 verse 1, I am sought of them that ask not for me. The Gentiles. What's happened? I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. Well, that's not Israel. That's us. We're a holy nation, a peculiar people. Verse 2, I have spread out my hands all day unto a rebellious people, Israel, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the mo uh, monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things as in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in thy nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore, I measure their former work into their bosom. Oh, they were doing so good. They were so right. Yeah, they only had one problem. They were idolaters. They had another God before the true and living God. See? And the Lord said, because of that thing, guess what? There's others now that are serving me. They've come into my house. They've gotten right. You haven't. See? Now, one day, Lord willing, they will. One day, God's going to... But notice what he said, verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. What did God just say there? I'm not going to kill them all. Just most of them. And then from that remnant, I'll go back to them and restore them. Verse 9, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit, and my servants shall dwell there. Millennial kingdom. All as a result of that spirit of that elder brother. And what did God do to Israel for that? What's been happening to him for the last 2,000 years, brethren? Because of that thing. Here's John the Baptist preaching. The sinners came. The publicans came. They got right. 
their hearts were broken. And because of that, they were prepared for when Messiah would come. But those Pharisees, those scribes, those Sadducees, those lawyers, they came to John Baptist's baptism. Did they repent? Were their hearts broken over their sin? No, it wasn't them. They were okay. They were perfect. It was the other guy that had the problem. See? Uh, we need to realize God's people, this church, is none of us perfect. We're all just a bunch of sinners. Amen. That get in. We got in on the best thing going, brethren. And we ought to be able to do everything in our power to reach all the sinners we can any way we can reach them. Amen. And uh, Lord, help us to do that. Never have that spirit of envy. That spirit of that older brother. Amen. And uh, I hope it's out of here. Amen. I hope it's out and stays out. Uh, I see it pop up. I'm going to do my best to smash it. Amen. Before it ever gets growing again around here. Amen. Amen. Don't any of us ever get to that point where we're, we don't want to reach out for those people. Amen. Amen. Once you've done that, you're done. The Holy Spirit cannot use you anymore. Because you don't tell God what you will do and what you won't do. You don't make deals with God. As a church, we need to say, God, here we are. Lord, whatever you want us to do to reach sinners, we're willing. Lord, you provide and uh, we'll be faithful. Amen. To do what we can. All right. Let's stand for prayer and we'll take a break for the service this morning. Brother Jacob, go ahead and close us in prayer, please. Amen. Amen. Take a break.